Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get dad for Father's Day? You should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one and save 15% off your order. The Battle of Ypres in 1915 marked the first major poisonous gas attack on Allied forces. The Allied troops didn't stand a chance because their equipment was not adequate to protect them from this deadly gas cloud, which left both sides of the battle stunned in disbelief. This is the year the hero of our story was born, and his story also resulted in the beginning of a fight for clean and safe equipment. This time it would be for the players of the NFL. Welcome to the Football History Dude Podcast, where each episode is a journey back in time to learn about the rich history of the NFL. Your host is Arnie Chapman. Football is his passion, and he wants you to come along with him to explore the yesteryear of the gridiron. So hop on board his DeLorean, and let's get this baby up to 88 miles per hour. This time as we step up for a DeLorean, the date is June 24th, 1915, and we are in Chicago, Illinois to witness the birth of this week's hero. This week's hero's name is Bill Radovich, because he would become known as the father of sports labor action. The reason why he was known for this is because he was the first player to really, you know, take it to the NFL, you know, over there on the courts for the right to play for the team of his choice. And the NFLPA site states that, when discussing the history of sports law, the name Bill Radovich almost always is at the forefront. Okay, before we get started here, I gotta let you know that this is part one of a four-part series that's gonna end up covering the history of the NFLPA all the way through the player rights movement that's still going on today. But how did we get here? What does Bill Radovich have anything to do with the NFLPA? Let's go back to his college days at USC. He was a standout guard and a linebacker. He earned a letter from 1935 to 1937, but he was a smaller guy. He was five foot eight inches, 161 pounds. So think about that a guard and a linebacker, 161 pounds in college. Well, he was known to be a scrappy little dude. He was a scrappy guard and linebacker that's not going to take any crap from anybody. Kind of reminds me of that Tom Petty song. You know the one. It's been covered by many big name musicians. And it's that one where it goes, no, whoa, whoa, back down. You can stand me up at the gates of hell, but I won't back down. Okay, so there's a reason why I'm not singing and I'm talking into this microphone as a podcast host. But nonetheless, Petty wrote this song as an act of defiance towards some random arsonist, some dillweed that decided to burn his house down. He said, I'm not going to back down. I don't care what you do. Johnny Cash comes to mind for many, even Sam Elliott in that Barnyard movie, the something about where the, the cow was singing about not backing down to the wolves. But most recently, the biggest one was Jason Aldean. He covered this song after the shooting occurred at his concert out in Las Vegas. And in a true American spirit, he said, you can knock me down. I got off that stage running around, but I will get back up and I'm not going anywhere. So you better bring it. And Radovich showed this same type of tenacity against the NFL. Because even though they tried to knock him down, he kept coming back. He had that tiny little scrappiness of an individual and he would not back down. So speaking of not backing down. He initially played with the Detroit Lions from 1938 to 1941, but then for 1942, 43, and 44 seasons, he joined the Navy to fight for America in World War II. Then he would come back to the Lions back in 1945 to earn his second All-Star berth, the first one he earned in 1939. This 1945 season, though, his head was elsewhere. He wasn't able to think about everything that was going on in the field because he had a sick father over in California. Now, in the 1940s, travel from Detroit to California, that takes a little bit more time and planning and effort than it does today. So he offered a request, a simple request. 
please either trade me to the West Coast or give me a pay raise so I can travel more to visit my dying father. At the time, Detroit owner Fred Medell Jr., he shot both of those requests down. He threatened to blacklist him if he went anywhere else. So he's all like, screw you guys, I'm out of here. He accepted a position with the Los Angeles Dons in the newly formed All-American Football Conference. The league had formed in 1946, but it didn't really last a whole long time. It would end up folding in 1949, and three of the teams would merge with the NFL. And he only played with the Dons for two years. Then he was offered a position to be an assistant player coach in the Pacific Coast Football League, which would be cool, right? However, this Pacific League was affiliated with the NFL, so his deal was revoked. Remember that blacklist thing? He was verifiably blacklisted from the NFL. And then, which means any affiliations, you cannot play for them either. Which I thought, this is officially not cool, man. However, he was not going to sit down. He was not going to back down. No, he would get back up. He took the NFL to court, and he would be the first player to do so for labor. He sued in 1949. The case was dismissed in the lower court, but eight years later, the Supreme Court ruled in favor of Radovich 6-3. The ruling said that unlike professional baseball, NFL was subject to antitrust laws. And I'm not really sure how all of this worked out, but nonetheless, that court order from the Supreme Court, they said that they were ordering the case to be retried. But at the time, Bill's lawyer, he urged against it. He said, dude, just take the settlement. It ended up being a settlement for $42,500. But the father of sports labor was born. And not only did this resonate with his own personal gains, it would help with future labor battles between the NFL and NFLPA, but other sports as well. In fact, from the NFLPA site, here's a quote. The landmark ruling not only resonated during future battles between the NFL and NFLPA, but also other sports. For instance, when challenging baseball's reserve clause in the 1960s, Marvin Miller, then executive director of the Major League Baseball Association, cited the statement from the Radovich case that baseball's long-standing exemption from antitrust laws was unreasonable, illogical, and inconsistent. So yeah, Bill Radovich, he's the reason why a lot of these players in this free agency period are able to go ahead and go to whatever team they decide to. But for himself, later on in life, he was an actor. There were three primary movies that were brought up that he was an actor in. The three movies were The World in His Arms, Back to God's Country, and Rocky Jones Space Ranger. So Bill Radovich passed away on March 6, 2002, which means that he was able to see the benefits of his trial for all the players in the league. And on November 12, 2012, the NFLPA announced a new program. This program would be a paid internship for veterans or active members of the United States Armed Forces. This would be for those that are interested in careers in sports industry. And it would, of course, be named after the father of it all, as far as labor fights goes, Mr. Bill Radovich, who was also a former NFL player, but also, even more importantly, a Navy veteran. But let's go back to the beginning. He was the first to stand against the machine, the NFL machine, but he would not be the last. We're going to fire that DeLorean back up. We're going to head over to 1956, because this is going to be the beginning of the NFL Players Association. And I will often reference a video from the NFLPA's website in this week and the upcoming week's episode. There's a link in the show notes if you want to check this video out yourself. You can get there through your podcast player or by heading to thefootballhistorydude.com. Also, I ask that you subscribe for free to this show by mashing that little subscribe button on your podcast player of choice. That way you get the freshest, hottest out the press episodes each and every week. Let's go to that video. One of the opening statements of the NFLPA history video was that the players had one premise. Clean socks and jocks. This is from the beginning, that is, not nowadays. I'm pretty sure that's a standard luxury, if you will. But back in the 50s, it wasn't as much so. The players in 1956, they wanted the owners to provide clean and safe equipment, which I feel is very reasonable. Now, it's nowhere near as heavy of a deal, but think about it. Soldiers back in World War I, they wanted the same thing. They just wanted safe equipment from that poisonous gas. And Demora Smith talked about how the players were tired of coming to work where teams didn't even wash their clothes or provide safe equipment. Just pretty standard, reasonable items that you would assume should be in there even in high school teams. They discussed how, at the time, many players had to come to the NFL from college teams where they were in a better situation. Better situation in the college ranks, maybe even high school, than you were dealing with in the professionals. 
No, that's not cool. They also had to get second or third jobs, most of the players. And although many believe that the players nowadays, you know, press it pants kind of players, they get a little bit too much treatment, back in the 50s, it was nowhere near the case. There was a quote from Bill Radovich that was in this video from later on in his life. You know, again, the father of sports labor action. And it went as such. The only strength the player has today to exist and get his fair share is to have a union and an association that goes to battle for him and supports him in every way he can. So we're talking about the mid-50s here. The Green Bay Packers were known not to be happy, the players that is, but it really started around the Cleveland Browns organization. The players asked Creighton Miller, who was the first general manager of the team, to help organize a players association. Creighton Miller was a former Notre Dame player and also an attorney. He declined at first, and finally he agreed in 1956. Unsure when they really started pestering him, and so not sure how many years in between the time that they started asking him and he finally agreed. But 1956, this is when they stated that he officially agreed. Fine, I will represent you. So with the Cleveland Browns players as his nucleus, Miller would reach out to players on other teams. He would recruit Don Shula to lead in Baltimore, Frank Gifford in New York, and Norm Van Brocklin over in Los Angeles. So by November of 1956, a majority of the players in the league signed authorizations for Miller and the new NFLPA to represent them. The first official NFLPA meeting in November of 1956 was at Waldorf Astoria Hotel in New York. It also happened to coincide with the game between the Bears and the Giants. Now only minor proposals for the meeting came out about, you know, to try to help the players. And from the NFLPA's site, it goes as such. Players requested $5,000 minimum salary. Uniform per diem for players, a rule requiring clubs to pay for players' equipment, and more importantly, a provision for continued payment of salary to an injured player. All of those seem really low standards compared to nowadays. But at that time, if they got that, they're like, man, that's a good victory for us. So the players submitted this proposal to the then Commissioner Burt Bell in January of 1957. And here's a quote from Creighton Miller through that NFLPA site. That kind of explains what the, you know, the meeting for the proposal and how the NFLPA was taken by the NFL owners, and it went as such. We made arrangements with the commissioner to go to Philadelphia during the owners' meeting. Burt Bell put us up at the Racket Club, and the owners were meeting at the same hotel. We got there maybe on a Sunday night, and Kyle Rote had to leave on Wednesday, and Norm Van Brocklin left about Friday. I was still there Saturday. And we never did get a chance to meet with the owners, and we never got a response from any of the proposals at the time. So this is when you're going to go ahead and cue up that Rodney Dangerfield quote. Go, I get no respect. You know, I get no respect. Can't say that one right either, but that's kind of what they felt like. It's like, dude, we put this organized proposal for you. The least you could have done is entertained us just for a little bit and said, here, even if you slapped me in the face and said, I don't, I'm not going to even comply with any of your requests or your proposals, demands, whatever that is, we are the owners. We own you. They didn't even do that. They would not even entertain the idea of bringing them into their meeting. They didn't even give them an answer. So at the time, this is when the players are like peeved off. They're thinking about, they snubbed us. They stuffed us so back that we're going to turn our ball cast backwards. We're going to get our game faces on and it's time to get serious. So the players decided to threaten with an antitrust lawsuit. Perfect timing though. Because this is the year, going back to Bill Radovich, where his case came back around to the Supreme Court, even though it originally started back in the 40s. So after his case was won against the NFL in the Supreme Court ruling, NFL owners started saying, well, I guess we got to accept some of these proposals of the players because we don't want it to go to litigation again. So flash forward to 1958. Mid-1958, that is. Players still get no respect. Injury clause protection was still not in place, even though they had agreed to it. And the players, some of them were not getting their additional $50 for each preseason game that was promised. So they are not happy. Also, to throw a little more of that kindling on the fire, sparking it up, getting it popping hot, there were proposals for their pension plan, hospitalization, and other benefits the owners ignored. So they are just raring to go. They are not happy about the situation. So November 1958, Billy Houghton of Green Bay Packers became the president of the NFLPA and he threatened antitrust lawsuits again. The owners agreed to this benefit plan, including hospitalization, medical and life insurance, and retirement benefits at age 65. But at the time, the commissioner, Burt Bell, gave his personal assurance to Houghton that it would get done. And he told him, just do this. Go in, 
say thank you to the owners, and leave town. Because, dude, you don't want to stick around after this comes out because you're going to have a bullseye on your back. But with that being said, this whole ping pong table match kind of back and forth deal sums it up for the 40s and 50s of the players fight for their rights. Now I'm going to leave you with this quote from the NFLPA history video and it goes as such. The great men that have played this game also understand it's a business and winning in this business takes more than being tough on the field. It takes a union, a union of men that must band together to protect their health, to protect their rights, to protect their families. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode of the Football History Dude and were able to gain some knowledge nuggets about the father of sports labor action and the birth of the NFLPA. In the upcoming episode, we're going to dive deeper into what the NFLPA did for the players during the 60s and the 70s. But for now, dudes, I'm through if you're through. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Football History Dude. To make sure you're the first to get the next episode, please subscribe with your podcast player of choice and head on over to thefootballhistorydude.com for the show notes and more information on the history of the NFL. And remember, dudes, where we're going, we don't need roads. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories. And Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.